Hello and welcome back to another episode of BodyWise Podcast. I am Christina Kerp, founder of the Casso Kitchen and your host for today's episode. I'm really excited that you're here. If you're listening in, please make sure to subscribe and to leave a review. Pretty, pretty, please. Hope you are enjoying this season's um, topic of menopause and hormone health at any age. Um, I've been, I know we've been loving um, recording these episodes. It's been amazing. Today, I have a guest that's a little bit different from what we've had all season, um, Sean Wells. He is a nutritional biochemist, a registered dietitian, certified sports nutritionist. He's formulated over 500 supplements, food beverages, and cosmeceuticals, and patented over 10 novel ingredients. Um, he's known as the ingre- ingredientologist, and he's, you know, a scientist and a, cl- you know, and, and just this chief clinical dietitian of over, with over a decade of clinical experience. Um, he's consulted thousands of people on natural health solutions. This, this keto, paleo, fasting, supplements. This guy knows his supplements better than anyone I've ever met. Um, he's personally overcome tons of health issues, um, Epstein-Barr, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, depression, insomnia, obesity, pituitary tumor. Sean is super vulnerable and just the sweetest, most empathetic person and always shares so much of himself. Um, he's a renowned thought leader on mitochondrial health um, and has, you know, he's always speaking at conferences. That's kind of how we met actually when he was speaking at KetoCon. So I'm really excited because today we're going to talk um, a lot about his journey, but also his new book, The Energy Formula. I'm going to pick his brain about um, supplements and lifestyle stuff and biohacking. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's get on with the show. Hi, Sean. Thanks for being on the show. Yo. What's going on? Not much. It's good to see. It's been like over a year since I've seen your face, I think. Oh, yeah, wow. that sucks for you. You need to see <laughs> me more. I know. It's been <laughs> wild. I feel like we saw each other at KetoCon, and then we did like a few lives on Instagram, and then things just got really crazy. But it's really good to see you again. It's great to see you, too. I'm looking forward to this. Oh, me, too. I know we did reschedule, but we're here. We made it really exciting for our listeners. Sean has an incredible book out called The Energy Formula, and we're going to dive into all about it because beautiful, because there's so much information in this book, which is so key to so many of, of you guys listening um, and things that I know I get asked about all the time. And, you know, Sean's the man to tell you because he's got he's the expert, like all the credentials <laughs> and, 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 for, and knowledge about this stuff. So why did you like? what, you know, why were you like, I have to write this book? Like, what was it that like clicked for you that you like, I have to make this book happen? Um, you know, it's kind of legacy stuff. Like I've, I've been doing a lot of this work, uh, clinically, academically creating supplements for about, and being keto for like the last 20 years. And I get asked a lot of questions, a lot of different ways from a lot of different people. And, I kind of wanted my story, my answers, my recommendations, like all in one easy place that I can just, you know, I was getting to the point where I was spending hours a day on, on DMs and emails and, and I never charge for any of that. And I want to help as many people as I can. So, you know, that's a big reason that I do podcasts as well as putting out this book and, you know, it's available as an ebook, as a hardcover, and I recorded the audible. So, um, you know, I hope that people take the time to listen to it, to read it, because it has just tons of great info in there. Yeah, that's amazing. I have a really important question, though. Did you record yeah. Audible in your movie phone? Yes, voice? you did. In my hello and welcome to movie phone. Voice. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, not exactly, but <laughs> kind of, kind of. I definitely used a good reading voice. And there was times when like, uh, when I tell stories that like my doctor was talking to me or my guidance counselor was talking to me that I use different voices and I'm like, hello, Sean, uh, wh- what do you think about the, uh, you know, stuff like that? It's so. awesome. I love when people do voices on audiobooks. It legit like <laughs> makes the experience for me. I'm going to listen to the audiobook now. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, I love that. I love that you made it super accessible all across the board. Um, and I know you have a really incredible story. I think a lot of times people, you know, in the health wellness space, you know, there's always that big thing of like, there's a really big why behind the work that we do. Um, do you want to tell, tell everyone a little bit about, about your story? Uh, yeah, I, I've, uh, I grew up in a, in a chaotic home bullied as well. And, um, I was morbidly obese, um, got to about 300 pounds and six foot two. And, uh, and then I 
swung the other way, became 150 pounds anorexic, like weighing myself every time I peed. Mm. And, you know, when I was overweight, I like had not only suicidal ideation, but I would like dream about taking a knife and just cutting the fat from my body. I hated my body. Even when I was 150 pounds, I didn't feel like I was ever thin enough or could see my, you know, abs enough. And uh, and then I got to a point where I was orthorexic and I was working out four hours a day and eating all the meals and I got to get my protein immediately and, you know, all the supplements. And if I didn't take every supplement in the exact fashion, then like I've wasted my workout and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of uh, obsession, a lot of insecurity. Uh, I ended up getting autoimmune disorders, no surprise with like the degree to which I hated myself and was working so hard. Um, I got Epstein-Barr virus, Hashimoto's, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, obviously suffering from depression and anxiety and multiple times of, of su suicidal ideation and, and being very close several times, uh, which led to my post that you were talking about uh, just yesterday. I've, I've spoken out a lot about depression and suicidal thoughts that my post was uh, a, a smiling picture of me like out on a sailboat. But at that time, I was very depressed and, and considering suicide often. Um, so, you know, I wanted to show people I saw another post that had like Robin Williams and Chris Cornell and uh, Chester Bennington and all these people that we know are like that are super popular, you know, that just committed suicide that were funny or talented or you know whatever and smiling in these pictures and and they killed themselves so it's just something that you know you want to tell people that it's not just you know some loner stoner you know that's has zero friends like you know it can be the people right next to you it can be you right. um so that's the point i wanted to make and i also got a brain tumor at one point uh, and, and all of this stuff led to, to my passions in supplements in biohacking in keto. And, and I've kind of honed in along the way, but I, I would actually say that the biggest turning point for me was about a year and a half ago, like right before COVID hit, uh, that I started doing plant medicine work and that shifted a ton for me. Like, that's when I was like, wow, I can love myself. And, you know, I don't have to like, I think I've spent my whole life insecure and grinding so that I could get to this certain level where I would get the external validation. They love me. I would then love myself. But until I get to this point, I won't. And of course, that point kept moving. Right. You know, I, I would be on Christina Kirk or I would be on, uh, you know, Ben Greenfield or what, but I'm not on Joe Rogan. I would be on local TV, but I'm not on national TV. I get on national TV, but I'm not on the Today Show. You know, I get a published book, but it's not on the new, you know, it's on USA Today and Forbes, but it's not a New York Times. Bestseller. It's like you can spend like your whole life, like, like keep moving that bar, especially when you're around very talented people. Right. You like pick and choose the things that are amazing about them, but you're also filtering out the struggles they have, the quote unquote weaknesses they have and like you know it's like you're we're always filtering like man they've got it good or they're they're way ahead of me and so I, I spent a lot of my life doing that and releasing that with plant medicine was so massive for me to like finally have love for myself to have some inner peace to have some freedom to just chase the things that light me up versus staying heads down mm -hmm. and then the biohacking made a lot more sense because I had that stable foundation of which to hack on top of. But I know so many people that do biohacking that are doing, you know, peptides and stem cells and cold plunges and saunas and working out and supplements and keto and, and they hate themselves. Right. And they're suffering. And so I just want to throw that out there. Like the biohacking is awesome but it's not the base. And I, and I've loved to see the evolution of biohacking. Like when I first learned about it, maybe 15 years ago or, or close to 20 years ago, it was, it was putting magnets in your fingers and chips in your head. So you could interact with devices more. And then it became 
you know, stem cells and peptides, and then it became bulletproof coffee and supplements, and then it was keto and fasting. And, and now it's like gratitude work and breath work and journaling. And, right. and, you know, it's, it's cool to see the evolution that's taken place of what biohacking is and, and biohacking now meaning really like ways to enhance your longevity and quality of life. Right. Um, you know, that's where like your, your health span comes from, not just lifespan. There's a term I talk about in the book, like lifespan is how long you live. Health span is how, how long you live healthy. Right. Like before you get disease, before your life is, the quality of life is greatly impaired. And so that matters because we can be diseased and pharmaceutical dependent and in a nursing home for 30 years, that's not ideal, you know? So that's, we don't want just long lifespans. We want long health spans. Right, right. Yeah, you talk about that in the exercise chapter, I think, and talking about how resistance training is a big part of that, which I will definitely get into. I want to circle back to something you said a little while back, but it was, it was very important where you mentioned that you had this kind of like self-hatred and no wonder you got an autoimmune disease. And I just want to like expand, use expand a little bit on that. Cause that is something that's not explored as much in the autoimmune space, that emotional side of healing and how we can like manifest these things because autoimmunity is when you like your immune system's attacking your, your healthy cells. Right. Um, and I actually, in like a retreat kind of thing one day, like a women's circle actually had a realization of the manifestation of my own autoimmune disease stemming from like that kind of self-hatred when I was younger. Um, so anyways, I, tell me a little bit more about that. Like what, like how did like- Auto, Autoimmunity is your body attacking itself mm -hmm. and not registering anymore what's an unhealthy thing to attack and what's a healthy thing to not attack. Right. It's just attacking you 24 seven. Right. You don't think there's the psychosomatic connection to that? Right. I mean, absolutely. It's just like, uh, like a lot of Dr. Joe Dispenza's work or, you know, th this kind of work where you see like um, trauma is stored in the body. Right. I mean, think about like, and if you look into chakras and, you know, like, you know, people might get throat cancer that like have suppressed their truth and aren't speaking up enough. Right. Like if you actually like look into this stuff, like there is deep psychosomatic connections. You'll see people that are you know, that are hunched over, that always cross their arms, that like don't trust, like they leave their solar plexus as small as possible, as and as covered as possible with their arms. Right. Well, that's interesting. And, and they've shown that like, when uh, even when a blind person wins a race, they put their arms up above them, right? Yeah. Or that like, when we feel uh, open and, and emotionally safe, like literally our body physically opens up, right? Okay. But like when we're not safe, we close down. We, you know, we, we literally tilt our head and cover our throat. We take our arms across like our stomach and, and organs and we hunch over and we get in like that seated position. This is all like, you know, the, the way your body works, it's, it's psychosomatic. And so that it's, it's totally true. When I was hating literally hating my body, hating myself, feeling like my body was always betraying me mm -hmm. instead of like being so thankful that because I was pushing so hard that I was working so many hours that I was doing so many things that weren't healthy for my body and my body was still hanging on. I should have been like, thank you body. Right. But instead I always felt like it was betraying me. Right. And no wonder, you know, I got sick. I got, I got a number of issues. I had, you know, surgery on my knees, on my hip. Like I had uh, two discs replaced in my neck. I had the brain tumor, you know, I had the, all these autoimmune issues and it's just no surprise. Like it wasn't until like, I really learned how to love myself, how to, to not hustle and grind, but hustle and flow to not just be heads down all the time, but be heads up and see how many amazing things are happening for me around me. I believe like you're in the right place, right time all the time. 
-hmm. You're just two heads down to notice. You're just too distracted to notice. There's incredible people and situations and things happening on your behalf all around you all the time. You're just too distracted. And you also talk about that in your book about like the, the, the power of being present and all the things that you do. And specifically when it comes to, you know, even like with, with the food that you're putting in your body and like, and, and that mindfulness regarding um, like nutrition is so important of like, just don't like you mentioned distraction, right. As like this, this, just the, one of the worst things like right now. And I think that right now we're in this world of like instant gratification, constant distractions, like overstimulation. Um, how do you feel that that's the kind of like the, the, the modern day, like almost like, like detriment to like society? Like how is that impacting people? There's control in that. I mean, yeah. first off, and there's addiction in that, you know, the where there is addiction, there's control. Right. And that's a dopaminergic pathway of like reward and distraction. Right. Uh, not that dopamine is bad, but the way that we get it in like kind of drips, like with likes and, and hearts and comments and scrolling and, you know, all of it is, is addiction. And if you, if you see what that's doing to us, like we spend way too much time in the past, which mm -hmm. is regret too much time in the future, which is anxiety and too little time in the present mindful. When we have our cell phone out at the table and we're with someone that sends a message, whether it's turned over, whether you're looking at it or not, it sends a message that my cell phone is very important and I'm not really that engaged with you, like, let alone someone who's on their cell phone sitting with someone, which is just horrendous or, you know, the eye watches or, you know, whatever it is that are literally just distraction, distraction, ding, notification, bell. Ching, 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 ding, 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 yeah. ding, 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 ding. You know, this is like, this is how we are. We're not present. Right. And they, there's tons of data to show that it takes anywhere from two to five minutes for task switching. We are not multitaskers. Mm -hmm. For us to be present and focused, we switch back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so we're never productive. And that's where I talk about in the book, like Cal Newport's deep work, or some of these ideas like uh, Tim Ferriss's four hour work week, like some of these concepts that can keep you productive. But Cal Newport's deep work, for example, like you get into work, let's say 8 a.m., you turn off the Wi Fi, turn off your cell phone, turn off all the notifications, close your door, do two hours of focused work. You will get more done in that two hours than people get done in eight hours of distracted work where they're looking at Facebook and Instagram and emails and phone calls and notifications and having chit chats with other people and, you know, outlook and whatever, like all this stuff, checking out this website, you're not really getting any work done of any quality. Right. And then so that, that, yeah, but that cycles into like not feeling like the stress if I didn't get it done or like self-worth issues or feeling lazy or you know, things add up. And like, we have so much of this, like perceived stress, right. That just like keeps adding up. And it's Yeah. And saying we don't have the time. And I'm literally <laughs> telling you in two hours, you can get more done. And then your typical eight hours, right. You have the time. It's just the quality of time and how you're using that time. Absolutely. So I want to segue, cause I'm talking about work and time and stress. And I want to talk about like, you know, positive stressors on the body and that balance, right? You talk a lot about like, like hermetic stresses in the book, you know, and like how, like that, I think is where a lot of people fail when they're trying to, let's say biohack or get healthy. Like what is that ideal load or like amount, um, you know, of like the, the, like the, between the positive and the negative stress and how much can you take at a time or like what factors play into that? Yeah, that's such a great question. That's, that is something that I cover in the book is this, this bell curve, if you can imagine it. And on the left hand side is U stress, EU stress, positive stress. And that means that the stresses that these are hormetic stresses, the stresses that you're adding are uh, increasing adaptation. So they're positive stresses for us. In the middle, in the center of that bell curve is the Goldilocks zone. This is the perfect amount of stress for the optimal amount of adaptation. So thinking, thinking about like, you know, it was just at the gym, you know, 10 pound dumbbells for curls, you know, you get some use stress, but are you, is it the optimized one? No, maybe it's like the 25 pound dumbbells that it's like, 
This is the optimal amount of stress for the maximum amount of adaptation. And then, you know, then there can be you sitting in the gym for four hours or you doing way too heavy weights or, you know, whatever it is. And now on the right hand side, that's distress. But it's a little bit more complicated than just one thing, or it can be more complicated than things that are typically perceived as positive hormetic stresses. Like, let's say you're going through a divorce. Let's say your husband just left and deployed in the military. <laughs> let's say that, uh, you know, your, your dog is sick. Let's say all these things, you know, that you, you have life happen and there's real stress, and this gets into allostatic load. Mm. This is your total amount of stress you have a capacity for. You have a stress bucket, and it's called allostatic load. And some people have big stress buckets, some people have small ones. And it's something that you can increase over time, but in the moment, you just got what you got. And when it's overflowing, it's overflowing, and it's distress. So, if you are dealing with, you just lost your job, you just went through a divorce, whatever, doing the cold plunge, doing the fasting, doing the hot sauna, doing the keto, doing the, you know, gym, you know, the hit training, you know, at the gym and what, that may be too much. That can be a distress. You have to listen to your body. And that's, you know, HRV is a good marker, whatever it is for you, like just listen to your body and say, you know what? I'm overstressed, I'm overtrained, I'm overwhelmed, I'm going to do more self-care than I am some of these hormetic stresses that can normally be healthy, that I normally enjoy, but now is not the right time for them. Right. Oh my God. Amen. Yes. That's something that I think women particularly, especially like women in certain like um, phases of their life, let's say like, you know, 40s, 50s, we see a lot of times big life changes, kids go off to college, or there's a divorce, or there's a move, or like menopause starts, and work is crazy, and then they're like, big calorie deficits, and HIIT training, and this, and they're like, but I'm gaining weight, and I'm like, all right, I'm not seeing the results I want, yeah. I feel like shit, and I'm like, because you did, too, yeah. too much is happening. Yeah, and then, yeah, exactly, and your body is gaining weight, because, you know, cortisol is elevated chronically, but also it's saying, whoa, what the fuck is happening here? We need to store up some energy right. ASAP to survive this. You're right. literally putting your body into like a questionable state of survival that you cannot sustain. And so it's saying, let's do the best we can to survive this. A hundred percent. And for those listening, so he mentioned HRV. So that's heart rate variability. Um, and I, I, my aura ring tells me mine. Um, do you know another way to track it? Yeah, bio strap, um, uh, the whoop strap. Okay. And I do believe uh, this year's Apple iWatch that'll be announced next month and the Samsung uh, Galaxy watch, they're both going to have more sensors to catch up with these other guys and, and do fitness tracking. Google bought like Fitbit. So I, I believe it's going to become more ubiquitous across the board okay. that we're going to see HRV across all these wearables. Okay, that yeah. said, I'm not the biggest fan of notifications and emails and texts and all those things coming through the watch. Yes, I do like, you know, the ring or like, yeah, the whoop strap or bio strap. They don't have a screen. Right. So, I mean, know. this one has my phone, but it doesn't send me notifications. And I, I mean, my husband's like, do you want an Apple watch? I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, when I unplug from my phone, when I step away from work. I don't want right. it following me around. That's the worst. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thanks for, I think you like, I think that that's, thank you for sharing it so succinctly about like the allostatic load, because that is something that people just hit, like they will just hit that wall time and time again. Um, and we see that, I see that a lot with women who are doing keto. They tend to like, when they, when they stall out, usually due to stress, they'll just fast longer and like, you know, work out more. And sometimes what they need is that self-care, right? Right. Um, and well, and that and that's the idea of like so like we know high intensity interval training is like probably the most effective way of training in the least amount of time. Right. But it's it's bursts, right? And that's the idea of like you dealing with uh, hormetic stress, you stress. When you stay in periods of stress chronically, then that is a distress, and you you can have periods without ease with unease, but if you're in it too long, it becomes disease. You literally get diseases from putting your body in a perpetual state of stress.
Yes, I did that to myself. Thank you. I know. I, I was doing Orange Theory like five times a week, which is like hour long hit training. And I was finishing my second book, which then I lost my manuscript and then rewrote the book in like a two week time and like never gave myself a minute to like stop. To right, right. And, and it's cool. You want to train like a pro athlete. One, you need to work up to it. Two, you need to probably kick up your calories, another 500 to 1,000 calories. Three, you need to get another hour or two of sleep a night. Four, you need to reduce your stresses all around it. All around. Cool. You want to be an Iron Man? You want to like get in the best shape of your yeah. life? Cool. Train like a real athlete. Right. And that's where you put all your focus. But if yeah. that isn't something that's possible, don't train like that. Right. And, he, and Mark Sisson talked about it when he was doing like Iron Man's. Like he, like he was sick all the time. He's like, it, like, you know, he couldn't even play Frisbee with his friends because he could like, you know, sprain an ankle or tear or something and like or he was yeah. getting the flu every year and it was like when you know this is just too much um so i want to move on to another one of my favorite topics and something you cover in the book and the nutrition section which is i love that you did is metabolic flexibility um it's just a topic near and dear to my heart <laughs> because i think even talking about training right and certain types of training and sometimes people do like when if you've been keto for a long time where does metabolic flexibility come in like what does that mean to you and how can someone apply that to their life well for me metabolic flexibility one i think that's an evolutionary ad like um adaptation advantage like to have more fuel capability mm -hmm. you know because yes like in in if you're just carb based, you can become glucose intolerant. But when you're just keto based, like pure, like, let's say like carnivore 24 seven, you become uh, glucose and like uh, you become sorry, um, yeah, intolerant to that. So you can't use both fuel sources. Um, so I love metabolic flexibility. Uh, for that reason is that you can um, have dual fuel. And like one of the things that that's helped me stay in for 20 years is that I've been um, cyclical and targeted ketogenic dieting for a long time. So one day a week, I eat whatever I want, and it doesn't really have that big of impact. Like maybe it's even just two meals on that one day, but I have pizza, I have, you know, whatever, ice cream, I, you know, whatever it is, like, um, that allows me to like stay on this long term. What what matters is sustainability. Mm -hmm. And don't worry about the keto police and the fasting police and the whatever. It's what can you keep up over a lifetime and feel healthy with. And for me, having some of these treats, whether they have sugar, whether they have canola oil or whatever the hell they have, like I'll have them every now and then because big picture if it's two out of my 20 meals a week, it really doesn't matter a whole lot. Right. And exactly. I look at those things as hormetic stresses instead of looking at them as negatives and they're hurting me. Um, you know, and if you can do it all without doing any quote unquote cheats, awesome. Like great for you. But like for me, this is what's maintainable and I consider it positive. And then when I play like sand volleyball for eight hours, like, you know, in a, in a tournament, like I have whatever I want. Like I literally will have Coca-Cola and gummy bears or whatever. And it right. sounds like I'm just eating garbage all the time. And it's not like I, eat, you know, very clean. I'm very like focused, you know, 90% of the time, but I allow myself 10% of the time to do what I do. Now with some people that may throw them off the wagon and they may just like, you know, never come back on. But for me, long term that's that's what's helped me stay on the ketogenic diet right. which is somewhat restrictive it's certainly gotten a lot easier of late with all the recipes and restaurants and oh, yeah. options and all the things but um i like i like to have that flexibility last thing is that carbs are not a necessity like you, there's no deficiency of carbs but two i don't demonize carbs or think they're bad it's a question of, did you earn them? And that's what I look at. Like, so when I'm, you know, I've been good and I've been low uh, insulin, low glucose, like all week. And then I have like, you know, a meal or two, it doesn't really move the needle. And same with, you know, if I'm highly active, it doesn't really matter because there's these glute four translocation 
you know, that that's happening and you're pulling uh, glucose into the cell. And, and this is one of the reasons why like the rest of the world can have carbs is because they don't overeat. They go, you know, they might have one meal a day. They, they fast often. They have low glycemic carbohydrates. They are always moving their body and highly active. You know, it's just, right. they're not, they're not like us. 87% <laughs> of the United States is metabolically dysfunctional. That's why keto is so effective for us. It's different than the rest right. of the world. Right. Cause we have, we, and there's this sense of like, when people say, well, like they're so surprised, like, oh my gosh, low carb. And like, I've always said, keto is this almost like overcorrection for overconsumption because carbohydrates, again, right. It's like, it's just, it's fuel, but they are like very quickly, you overeat it. It's going to be stored as well. It's going to, insulin's going to be high. They're going to be inflammatory. So yeah, if you match, like a triathlete can probably get away with eating a hundred what is it? Chris Fromm. He's a cyclist, right? And he's essentially keto, but he eats 120 to 200 grams of carbs a day, but he's exactly. riding hundreds of miles a week. So he's still in ketosis because he's burning through them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, right. Like you mentioned them that earning them, it's like what you're burning, you're not storing what you're burning is like, you're running through it. And, but it's that sense of like, well, I'm having, you know, I'm sedentary and meals consisting of carbohydrate. Like that's just going to build up. It's going to be inflammatory. It's going to cause weight gain. And that's when we get to that issue. And I agree in the U S we kind of, you know, we tend to overdo a lot of things. <laughs> We're like the, our culture here is like that instant gratification. Everything's hyper palatable. And we've gotten away from like what true food and fuel is like. And, and even like, you know, culturally appropriate the foods and foods, like, you know, the way our great, our grandparents ate and great grandparents, like, it wasn't Big Macs, you know, like supersized meals, like that stuff didn't exist. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and that brings up like the idea, like, I, I want to end this once and for all with like the idea that fat is bad for you. Uh, it's not, you are what you eat. It's you burn what you eat. Mm. If you eat a lot of fat, you'll become optimized at burning fat. If you eat a lot of carbs, you'll be a great sugar burner, a lot of protein, you'll oxidize that and turn that into glucose. So you know, gluconeogenesis. So it's you burn what you eat. Uh, and the problem with all these studies that say high fat diets cause weight gain and, and cardiovascular issues. If you look at all these studies, they're also in one, like a lot of the animal studies are with polyunsaturated fatty acids or trans fats, right. but two, they're also with like maltodextrin or fructose or whatever. Right. And that is the double whammy. That's the, the big Mac diet is high, high glycemic high and food. high fat. Like that's, that is a terrible combination. There's only one place that occurs in nature that I know of. And that's, you know, a bear eats a lot of berries and fatty fish right before it hibernates and gains a ton of weight, weight. in the winter. Right. <laughs> so it's a bad combination, but unfortunately that's the combination of those hyper palatable foods that you're talking about. Right. And which why people then feel like addicted to and can't stop. And because it lights your little, like, you know, primal brain receptors of like that bear for hibernation, like this is going to help me survive winter, but mm -hmm. we don't have winter. We're not hibernating. We have a refrigerator. <laughs> like we always have food. <laughs> so yes. we don't need that. Yeah. That's it's, I think that's definitely something that when I, when I work with people who are still on low fat diets, I'm like, Aish. and we see so many health issues come from low fat diets, like essential fatty acid deficiency is like definitely an epidemic of the standard American diet. Um, because then your gallbladder doesn't work properly and you're not like your bile's not flowing. And then people have gallbladder attacks. It's a whole thing. Like, and you know, babies of the eighties and the nineties, like with the low fat yogurt phase, you know, it's a whole issue. So let's talk about, and I love the, the growth chapter. And you talk a lot about like that gap between, you know, living in this modern day world and with our actual like bio individual demands. Like, and I, I find that, you know, even just saying this, like we are primal beings living in a modern world, you know? So like, how do we bridge that gap to like survive? <laughs> how do we bridge the gap to, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think, I think it's not all negative in terms of the, the, you know, and that's where biohacking comes in. Like I was talking about, there is like amazing science that's coming in and we can use peptides and exosomes and these cool new supplements and, and all of these things, the, the testing, the aura ring, the, you know, epigenetics, and there's such great science that's coming in that, you know, we're blessed to have now in biohacking, but also we need to look back 
primally to like what used to work, like what is our body meant for? And our body's meant for natural movement, for play, for creative time, for meditation, prayer, whatever, journaling, basically reflecting inward. Right now we're constantly distracted. We're ignoring ourselves. And surprisingly, we're not connected to our health and our body and our, and our mind and our spirit. Like we're always in a state of distraction. So that's problematic. So a lot of those biohacking is about getting to your inner truth, getting connected to your body, mind, and spirit, like listening to that and not ignoring it anymore. And, and in that way, your health can dramatically improve. Your self-love can dramatically improve. Your affirmation, your, your sense of what's true for you can be much clearer when you're doing these things. So if you add those two together, that can be really helpful. And then of course, dropping the hyper palatable foods, dropping the clickbait news, dropping like uh, toxic friends, you know, all of these things are going to be important too. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's so important. I feel like the, the lifestyle stuff, like dropping the toxic friends and the clip news, like the people really struggle with that stuff, like putting the phone down, limiting the screen time, stop scrolling. Um, but absolutely like so imperative. Okay. So we're running out of time, but before I want to let you go, I want to talk about, you have so many really good, like supplement recommendations in the book. I know that's like totally your jam, but one that I think is like, not as understood or people don't really understand the full benefit of is CBD. And I, and you really go into like the endocannabinoid, uh, endocannabinoid system. Um, and I love that because I've had such great experience with CBD, but can you kind of tell us why it's amazing? I love how you say you're like, it's like the, the body's natural adaptogen system. Um, and I thought that was really cool. I'd never heard of it explained like that. So yeah. Tell us why CBD is cool. Yeah, exactly. And, and adaptogens are actually a big favorite of mine as far as a class of supplements. And when you look around the world, you look at these compounds like rhodiola from Russia, maca from South America, ginseng from Asia, ashwagandha from India. They're the most legendary herbs because they help the body deal with stress. They improve that allostatic load bucket. And surprise, surprise, it enhances your sleep and enhances your libido, your muscle mass gain, your, you know, your longevity reduces inflammation. But it's amazing they do everything because it's helping your capacity for stress. And in the body, there is a system that helps with this stress load, this allostatic load, and it's called the endocannabinoid system. It's the master regulator system that helps with mood, depression, uh, pain, inflammation, all of these things. And what's interesting is there's all these specialists and doctors for the circulatory system, for the cardiovascular system, the musculoskeletal system. But I don't know of any doctors that focus on this master regulator system. What? Like, I mean, it's literally, you could argue with like one of the most critical uh, systems in the body, and yet none of us are talking about it, and there's not a lot of research around it. And of course, just like with any other system, you may have deficiencies, either genetically at birth or epigenetically from your environment, food, you know, what's taking place over time. And so some of these compounds, these, these exocannabinoids uh, may help, these uh, cannabinoids that are from plants. Uh, so CBD is one and obviously the psychoactive THC people know well, but there's all these other ones that are being looked into too, like CBG, CBN, uh, CBDA, and all, all these different compounds that affect that endocannabinoid system where there may be a deficiency. And, and we're now seeing, uh, people that are taking 30 milligrams, hundred milligrams and seeing incredible benefits of CBD on their pain, their inflammation, their mood, depression, uh, you know, all of these things, and they're having better recovery, better uh, sleep, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And same with horses, with dogs, we're seeing, you know, benefits across the board. Um, and it just seems like a, a vastly understudied, under, understudied area. And so I definitely recommend exploring that and trying some of these cannabinoids and seeing if they help you, you know, try different doses, different blends, um, and just seeing what works for you. There's a lot of bioindividuality there, but certainly it seems like many people benefit from these compounds. 
Awesome. Yeah, I started I started with some topical stuff and that was like okay, but I really like I take it orally and like it I do I feel like it helps with inflammation and with sleep. Um I remember the first time I took it, I like took too much and I was actually meeting Diane Sanfilippo like here at a news station because she was like on like on what, a morning show for her book and I was like so out of it. <laughs> I remember being like so tired. I got back and I was like, I need to take a nap, but that's not really not what doesn't what happen. I just took like I missed dose and I think I was using um I forget, uh, Santa Cruz medicinals. And uh-huh. it was like a heavy dose one anyway. I'm not good at math. So that was the whole thing. But I do I do take it regularly now for sleep and it's wonderful. Um, so that's great. And yeah, I like that you mentioned the bio-individuality because I know some people like some brands work for one person, but not for another. It's kind of like thyroid medication, right? Everyone's yeah. got the one that's like just right for them. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, and that's so important. That's actually the E in the book is experiment. Yeah. Uh, that first E in, in energy. It's experiment, nutrition, exercise, routines, growth in your tribe. But the E is all about exploring that bio-individuality, getting those metrics so you can do your own testing and understand what works for you and knowing that what works for your friend at work, your your mom, your neighbor, like may not work for you and understanding that and understanding what that means and, and also to not do this shotgun approach of trying 20 things at once and using the scientific method and just doing one thing at a time, seeing if it works for you, adopt it or don't adopt it, and then move on to the next thing. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really sound advice. I know it's like, you don't, you won't know what it is that's working if you're doing 10 things at a time. So solid advice, John. Thank you so much. Well, I'm super excited for everyone to get the book. It's awesome. Solid information. I love how actionable it is. I love how vulnerable you are and how you share and just today. And yeah, so the book available anywhere books are sold. And I know on your website, you also have the ebook. So if you prefer that route um, or the audio book and you can hear Sean's soothing voice. Um, yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, if you go to energyformula.com, like I have the links for like iBooks and Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that. But uh, if you go through there, then you can get my free fasting for energy guide, my hidden chapter on natural movement, something that we're sorely missing these days, uh, like that primal kind of movement crawling yeah. and all those kinds of things I get into the research there, Q and A's, recipes, all kinds of stuff, energyformula.com. Awesome. And then check out seanwells.com, S-H-A-W-N. I have like free scientific guides and blogs and research that's coming out every week. And then at Sean Wells, S-H-A-W-N on Instagram, a lot of infographics, cool stuff, stacks, all of it's free. The book's the only thing I charge for in my whole world. And because it's expensive. It's full color front to back. And it's beautiful. Um, and books are worth it. Support, support authors. Um, yeah, and I will, I will yeah. link all of your stuff. So I will link Sean's website and the book website and your socials on in the show notes as well. And we will also be linking um, suicide prevention hotlines as well uh, for those listening. So thank you, Sean, so much for being, and it was so good catching up with you um, and everyone make sure to go get the energy formula. Thanks, Christina. Bye. See you guys. <laughs>